Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Pat Tracy, and I'm here to welcome you to Brickcourt Chambers Pharmaceutical Roundup. Uh, I'm just going to wait for a minute or two before actually formally starting proceedings, just to make sure that everyone who wants to join can join. Uh, but uh, first of all, on behalf of the whole Brickcourt team and myself, it's a delight to see so many of you registering and attending today. So thank you very much. Uh, Probably worth starting with a couple of housekeeping points, uh, the most important of which is to say that there is no question facility enabled digitally for this webinar. So if you do have a question or a comment on any of the presentations that you hear this afternoon, please could you send an email to marketing at brickcourt.co.uk. So that's very important because we're sure that you'll have plenty of questions to ask. So do send them through and we'll gather them together and probably deal with them in panel format at the end of the webinar. So as we've now reached one minute past two and we've got quite a bit to get through this afternoon, let me first of all say how delighted I am to have been asked to chair this seminar because a lot has happened in the pharmaceutical sphere over the last year to 18 months. And each of our speakers today has been closely involved in the matters that they're going to be talking to you about. So I'm sure that you'll find it particularly interesting and relevant. The seminar is going to cover a broad array of topics that are of interest to the pharmaceutical industry, particularly from the perspective of regulatory and competition law. And as you will have seen from the agenda, there's plenty to discuss. And this really reflects the degree of attention the pharmaceutical industry has received in recent years from all sorts of public authorities and the legal uncertainty that, that has brought with it. As I mentioned already, there could be no, <clears throat> excuse me, no finer guides to take you through this seminar than the people that you have before you. And I'll introduce them as we go through. And first of all, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is Kellen Bacon QC. And she is going to talk to you about the recent litigation between the CMA and the pharmaceutical companies, Pfizer and Flynn. Uh, the Court of Appeal handed down judgment on the substantive issues in this case about three months ago, and then on some quite interesting costs issues a couple of months after that. So Kellen's going to take you through some of the key issues, and I'm sure that you will find what she has to say very interesting. And again, I encourage you, please, to send questions uh, via the email. Thank you very much, and, and Kellen, over to you. Thanks very much, Pat. If I could have the first slide and the next one, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to talk about the Pfizer and the Flynn cases in the Court of Appeal. And um, could I have the previous slide, please? Thank you very much. So, um, these cases raise all sorts of interesting issues because they fall on the interface between pharmaceutical regulation and competition law. And the cases came out of a five year investigation by the CMA into the pricing of the anti epileptic drug phenytoin following its genericization. And at the end of that investigation, the CMA found that both Pfizer and Flynn had abused their dominant positions by charging excessive prices for the product, and it fined them both. On appeal by both Flynn and Pfizer, the Competition Appeal Tribunal in June 2018 upheld the finding of dominance, but set aside the finding of abuse on the basis in particular that it considered that the CMA had erred in several important respects in its interpretation of the legal test and its approach to the assessment of whether the price of phenytoin was excessive. That then led to the recent appeals to the Court of Appeal on the substance of the case and on costs. Starting with the substance, which is on this slide, uh, the headline point is that the Court of Appeal upheld the tribunal's judgment and the CMA has not sought to appeal that further so that the Court of Appeal's judgment is the last word on the matter. The case has now been remitted to the CMA to reconsider in light of the appeal rulings. The substantive judgment is 75 pages long with separate judgments delivered by both uh, Lord Justice Green and the Chancellor. <clears throat> 
Um, in, so in the fashion of 10 minute Shakespeare, I'm going to try and reduce it to five key points today. Number one, uh, and perhaps the most important point, uh, the test for excessive pricing set out in the United Brands judgment is the Court of Appeal found not to be re read uh, rigidly or literally. So that when the United Brands refers to a price being imposed um, being excessive when it is either unfair in itself or unfair when compared to competing products, that does not give a competition authority free reign to establish that a price is excessive based on a single test uh, on the basis of one, one of those limbs while ignoring other evidence that indicates the opposite. Now, on the facts, that single point was fatal to the CMA's case, which had rested on an assertion that if a cost plus test indicated that Pfizer and Flynn's prices were excessive, the CMA could, as a matter of law, ignore the fact that those prices were below the price of a direct comparator product in the form of phenytoin tablets. Since that um, approach was wrong, um, the CMA's decision had to be reconsidered. So that was the first and perhaps, as I said, most important point um, to emerge from the judgment of the Court of Appeal. Um, but the court also took the opportunity to clarify a number of points that had been made in the tribunal's judgment. So that brings me to the second point, which is that the court um, uh, confirmed that there is no single test for excessive pricing that will be relevant in all cases. What will be appropriate will depend necessarily on the facts of each case and the evidence presented to the authority. Uh, number three. Uh, the CMA has, the court found, a duty to consider to, to conduct a fair assessment of all of the evidence before it, and it cannot simply fall back on the claim that any errors can be corrected in due course by the tribunal on appeal. And as the Court of Appeal emphasised, the CMA has powers that can lead to vast fines that are regarded as quasi-criminal and which can have serious further consequences in terms of reputational damage and follow on damages claims. And no undertaking should um, be subject to that, Lord Justice Green said, without a proper evaluation of the evidence. Number four, uh, the assessment of whether there is an excessive price must be conducted by reference to a benchmark or indeed multiple benchmarks in an appropriate case. But that does not mean that the CMA has to construct a hypothetical benchmark price in every case. So it doesn't have to go in search of a benchmark price, but necessarily whether something is excessive has to be judged by reference to some sort of counterfactual benchmark. And the fifth key point of substance is that there was a particular issue in the case um, that will be relevant to many other um, pharmaceutical cases, I imagine, about how the economic value of the product should be taken into account in the sense of patient benefit. Now, the, the Court of Appeal slightly disagreed with the approach taken by, um, by the tribunal on the law, um, and it found that this had to be taken into account at some stage in the assessment, which the CMA hadn't done, but what was not required was to assess economic value as a separate or additional test under the excessive pricing analysis. Um, so although it reached the same conclusion on the facts as the, as the tribunal, the, the legal approach was slightly different to the approach that the tribunal had taken on that particular point. Looking at this overall, the most important takeaway for other cases is I think that in any analysis of excessive pricing, the CMA will not be able to rest its case on a, on a single piece of evidence or a narrow set of evidence that points in one direction. Um, what it will have to do is to take proper account of any exculpatory evidence that is put forward by the parties under investigation that points the other way. Turning then to the issue of costs, and if I can have the next slide, um, the unusual feature of this case is that the cost judgment has perhaps even more profound implications generally for cases than the substantive judgment. And the costs issue was determined by a differently constituted Court of Appeal at a separate hearing after the court's substantive judgment had been handed down. 
And the backstory to the costs dispute is that the historic position of the Competition Appeal Tribunal, established since the earliest ca cases before it, is that the starting point um, in assessing costs should be that costs follow the event. But the tribunal will nevertheless take all relevant factors into account as they arise in a particular case. That's the basis on which the CMA itself has claimed costs in all of the cases in which the CMA itself has been successful. But in this case, when the CMA lost, its argument was that the starting point as established by the tribunal was wrong. Um, rather, that the starting point should be that no order for costs should be made against it on the basis that it was acting purely in its regulatory capacity. And the CMA relied in particular on the Court of Appeals judgment in BT and Ofcom, which had been handed down after the tribunal's um, judgment on the appeal in this case, but before the tribunal made a decision on costs. And the tribunal considered BT and Ofcom, which was decided in a different um, kind of regulatory capacity. It wasn't a, it wasn't a Competition Act appeal. Um, and the tribunal considered that in this sort of appeal, the, um, the, the usual um, costs rule should be applied. Um, unfortunately for Pfizer and Flynn, the Court of Appeal disagreed and found in favour of the CMA. And both Pfizer and Flynn have now sought permission to appeal to the Supreme Court. I probably don't need to emphasise that this issue will have very profound impl implications, not only for the pharmaceutical sector, for which there are a number of ongoing uh, investigations by the CMA, but also for any undertaking that is subject to, invest an, uh, to an investigation by the CMA. Um, because on the Court of Appeals analysis, those undertakings under investigation will face the prospect not only of spending a large amount of money during the investigation itself, but then perhaps um, spending an even larger amount of money, um, often running to millions of pounds, in order to clear um, its name, if it contests the decision of the CMA, um, particularly if that case goes to a, a long trial as, as the present case did. Um, but on the Court of Appeals analysis, uh, the an undertaking will not, as a default position, be able to recover costs, even if it is successful. Um, so that will have um, severe consequences for those undertakings. And, uh, and that is one of the reasons why um, why this th this judgment has been contested um, or is sought to be contested before the Supreme Court, um, at which hopefully the Supreme Court will have the opportunity to, to reconsider the, the line of jurisprudence that led to BT and Ofcom and the costs ruling in this particular case. So uh, unusually then in this case, both, both the substance of the case and the costs approach have been the subject of considerable interest and I think are important to this sector. So that's what I wanted to say about um, those cases. And of course, I'll be happy to take questions at the end. Thank you very much, Kellen. And just to remind people, if you do have questions about what Kellen had to say, please do email them to marketing at uh, brickcourt.co.uk. Um, did very well to get through that so quickly, Kellen. Um, that brings us to uh, David Scannell, you see, who's going to take us through the next important case. Uh, now, as many of you will be aware, the question of the treatment of paper delay agreements in the pharmaceutical sector has been a hot topic since at least the publication of the Commission Sector Inquiry report more than 10 years ago. Uh, I'm very happy to say that David was involved in the first case in which the Court of Justice actually had the opportunity to review the, uh, uh, the uh, way in which competition law applies to such cases. Um, he acted for GlaxoSmithKline uh, before the Court of Justice, and he's going to explain to us the way in which the court looked at the approach of the CMA and the CAT in the Paroxetine litigation. Thank you, Pat, and good afternoon, everybody. On the 30th of January this year, the fourth chamber of the Court of Justice gave its judgment in Generics UK. This case is sometimes referred to as Paroxetine, and sometimes more tendentiously is the pay for delay case. The case is of considerable importance as the now leading authority on the question of how competition law applies to agreements between pharma companies settling patent disputes. The case was referred to the, comp to the Court of Justice by the Competition Appeal Tribunal, 
and it may well go down in English legal history as both the first and the last reference ever made by the tribunal. I'll begin with a few remarks about the underlying CAT proceedings and how the reference arose. I'll then address the preliminary ruling and offer some strictly personal observations along the way. The underlying proceedings comprise separate appeals against the CMA's paroxetin decision by an originator medicines manufacturer, that's GSK, and by various generics manufacturers, including Generics UK. These companies had entered into a number of settlement agreements in the early 2000s, putting to an end patent disputes between them. The disputes arose because the generics wanted to market generic versions of Siroxat in the United Kingdom. Siroxat is a peroxidin based antidepressant uh, medication marketed by GlaxoSmithKline. GSK alleged that the generics products infringed its patents. The generics raised the typical defenses of non-infringement and invalidity. Under the settlement agreements, the generics agreed not to continue their attempts to enter the market with the allegedly infringing products, and GSK agreed to make compensation payments to those generics. It was not alleged that these payments amounted to more than the generics would have earned if they had been free to market their allegedly infringing peroxidin products. GSK also agreed to supply the generics with non-infringing peroxidin. This was marketed by the generics in their own livery. So under these settlements, both sides accepted something short of what they were asking for in the underlying litigation. They compromised. In the Peroxidin decision, the CMA said that these settlement agreements infringed Article 101 of the treaty and Chapter 1 and amounted to an abuse by GSK of a dominant position it held on a product market comprising Peroxidin only. I've set out the procedural history uh, in the slide that you can now see. The CAT appeals were launched in April 2016. They were heard in February and March 2017. Almost a year then passed before the tribunal's judgment appeared on the 8th of March 2018. The judgment contains the tribunal's key factual findings, but most of the major legal issues were referred to the Court of Justice. On a procedural note, none of the parties had sought this reference, and they had made their positions clear in that respect at an early CMC in the appeals. But in the course of closing argument, the tribunal indicated that it was nevertheless considering a reference. Similar issues were already before the Court of Justice in the Lundbeck appeals, so it's understandable that the tribunal wanted to ensure that its final judgment would be consistent with whatever the Court of Justice said in those cases. But as events turned out, the Competition Appeal Tribunal's reference overtook the Lundbeck appeals. And in fact, we still don't have a final judgment from the Court of Justice in Lundbeck. To complete the procedural picture, the CAT now has the Court of Justice's preliminary ruling, it has had since January, and its final judgment is awaited. As to the ruling itself, the first point of note is that the court's key conclusions on potential competition, object, market definition and abuse are confined by the court to a particular fact scenario. This is the scenario in which the originator's product patent has expired, its process patents remain in place and it relies on the process patents to resist market entry by a generic. These were, of course, the facts that were explained to uh, the court by the tribunal, but the extent to which the Court of Justice strains in the reference to confine the scope of its legal findings to this factual scenario and to no other factual scenario is nevertheless striking. The first question addressed by the court was whether an originator whose product patent has expired but whose process patent has not. I'm just, I'm going to uh, change to the next slide. Uh, and a generic preparing to enter the market can be regarded as potential competitors when they're in a dispute about validity and infringement. The court recalls the recognizable two-tiered test, asking first whether the generic had a firm intention and an inherent ability to enter the market, and second, whether there were barriers to entry that were insurmountable. It's for the national court to apply that test. The first tier of the test focuses on whether the generic 
company has uh, taken sufficient preparatory steps to enter the market within a short enough time frame to impose some sort of competitive pressure on the originator? Has the generic secured an MA, for example? Has it secured access to a stock of generic medicine? Has it begun to market the medicine? And so on. The second tier is a bit more difficult. According to the court, the question here is whether the generic had real and concrete possibilities of entering the market, notwithstanding the existence of the originator's patent. I'd suggest that the words notwithstanding the existence of the originator's patent here are troublesome. They could mean ignore the patent completely and ask whether the generic has a real and concrete possibility to enter the market. But that's a somewhat artificial analysis, to put it no fur further. Whether the possibilities are real and concrete arguably depends entirely on whether the patents can be overcome. If the patents are not ignored, further difficulties rise. In some cases, it won't be possible to tell who would have won and who would have lost the patent dispute. Indeed, they were the facts of Broxton itself. So how can one tell whether notwithstanding the existence of the originator's patent, the generic has a real and concrete possibility of entering the market? It might be said that all there is in that case is a hypothetical possibility that the generic can enter. But the Court of Justice has explicitly reaffirmed a paragraph 38 of the ruling that a hypothetical possibility is not enough to make the generic a potential competitor of the originator. The second issue related to object. Here, the Court of Justice said that a patent settlement agreement can amount to a restriction of object if it is clear that the net gain from any transfers of value by the originator to the generic cannot be explained otherwise than by the party's commercial interest in not competing on the merits. In other words, the litigation is bought off somehow. The court added a rider that even if this is the case, the agreement is nevertheless not restrictive by object if it is accompanied by proven pro-competitive effects capable of giving rise to a reasonable doubt that the agreement causes a sufficient degree of harm to competition. The short personal observation I'd like to make on this aspect of the court's ruling is that it sits uneasily with the court's recent case law on object restrictions. These cases have emphasized that if there is ambivalence as to whether the agreement, the effects of an agreement are positive or negative, an effects assessment should be conducted. But of course, the essence of the settlement agreements in paroxetin is that their effects were ambivalent. If the parties had not settled, there were really only two possible um, outcomes. Either GSK would have won or the generics would have won. If GSK would have won, the settlements could hardly be said to have restricted competition. If the generics would have won, then the settlements could have restricted competition. So the settlement agreements were paradigm examples, I would suggest, of agreements with ambivalent effects. Interestingly, in the court's very recent judgment in Budapest Bank, uh, the citation of which appears on the slide, the court has again uh, reaffirmed that ambivalent elements of agreements cannot be ignored when assessing whether uh, there is a restriction of competition by object. David, I'm sorry, we can't hear you, or at least I can't. Uh, thank you, Pat. Can, can I be heard now? Yes, you can. Thank you, Pat. So I was turning to effects, and on effects, the court has held that it's not necessary on the counterfactual to show that the generic had a greater than 50% chance of uh, winning the underlying dispute. On the other hand, it seems reasonably clear that the effects cannot simply be assumed on the basis that there was an agreement between potential competitors. All realistic possibilities have to be considered as part of a proper counterfactual assessment, including whatever is known about respective prospects of success and the likelihood of entering into a less restrictive settlement agreement. Finally, on market definition and abuse, starting with market definition, the question was whether it was permissible to include in the definition of the market generic versions of the originator's product, where it's alleged that the originator has sought to rely on process patents to impede generic entry. 
The court here said at paragraph 140 of its ruling uh, that a count can be taken of generic versions of the originator's medicine if the generic companies are in a position to present themselves within a short period on the market concerned with sufficient strength to constitute a serious counterbalance to the medicines already on the market. And of course, it's for the national court to apply that test. I would suggest that this does not mean that the traditional approach to market definition in pharma cases no longer applies. It remains important to consider therapeutic substitutability and non-price competition, as the general court has emphasized recently in Servier. But what peroxidant does mean is that at least in pharma cases, the nature of the abuse allegation may be relevant to market definition, and the products that are not yet on the market may be included in the analysis, so long as they were trying to get onto the market at the relevant time. Now, whether that erodes the period of protection afford, afforded by patents is open to debate. The final matter addressed by the court in Proxton was abuse. And here the court held that it can amount to an abuse of a dominant position for an originator to have a strategy of concluding settlement agreements which keep generic companies off the market temporarily provided that the strategy has the capacity to restrict competition and in particular to have exclusionary effects that go beyond the specific exclusionary effects of each of the settlement agreements that are part of the strategy. Two very quick points here. First, there must apparently be distinct effects analyses for the settlement agreements in question and then for the strategy. The strategy can only be abusive if it causes effects if it causes effects that go beyond the particular effects of the settlement agreements. And second, it's not unusual for pharmaceutical companies to have a strategy in place to manage the twilight years of patent protection and to monitor litigation in multiple jurisdictions. The Paroxetin ruling makes it clear that care will have to be taken to ensure that these strategies are competition compliant. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, that was extremely interesting. There's a lot in the case, and I think the Lundbeck judgment will be a very interesting one, having seen the Advocate General's opinion already. So we await that with some interest. And that brings us back to the domestic uh, jurisdiction, uh, where Sarah Ford QC is going to take us further into the knotty relationship between patent litigation and uh, competition law from a case called uh, Teva and Chiesi, where Sarah acted for Chiesi. She was also in the proxy litigation, but I think we're going to ask her just to confine her comments at this stage to uh, Teva and Chiesi. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Pat. I'm going to be speaking about a judgment handed down by Mr. Justice Burse in June of this year. And he had to decide for the first time whether being required to provide sensitive information or documents by way of disclosure can contravene Article 101 of the treaty or the Chapter 1 prohibition of the Competition Act. The underlying proceedings were patent litigation. Tava had sought to revoke three patents held by Chiesi for a pharmaceutical product used in the treatment of asthma. And Chiesi counterclaimed for infringement of its patents and Tava duly applied to strike out the counterclaim. The strikeout application was made on two grounds. The first was that it was argued that the infringement claim was insufficiently particularised and so it didn't give rise to a viable claim as a matter of patent law. And the second, and from my perspective, at least more interesting argument that was made was that if Teva was required to give disclosure to Chiesi in the patent infringement proceedings, then it would amount to anti-competitive information exchange. And so it would the, the, the process of disclosure would be prohibited by Article 101 or the Chapter 1 prohibition. So it was said on that basis, the uh, counterclaim should be struck out. There were broadly three limbs to Tabor's argument. The first limb was to say that the sort of information that would be provided by way of disclosure, and it's things like descriptions of Tabor's product, and its manufacturing process were necessarily commercially sensitive, confidential information. And there wasn't really any dispute about that. It's, it's certainly the case that that sort of information would normally be disclosed into a confidentiality room. And that was the first limb. The second limb of the argument concerned the paroxetine judgment that David's just been speaking about, because Tabor said 
it's become clear from what the Court of Justice said in Paroxetine that Teva and Chiesi would be considered potential competitors for the purposes of competition law. And the obvious point which comes to mind when, when it's suggested that disclosure might be in some way anti-competitive is to say, well, surely not, because that would mean that what the patent court's been doing for many decades would, would suddenly breach competition law. And Teva pointed to the Paroxetine judgment as really the answer to that objection. They said, well, it's only just become clear as a consequence of the, of the, the Court of Justice's clarification, uh, in particular in relation to potential competitors in Paroxetine, that Teva and Chiesi might be considered potential competitors and therefore might fall foul of competition law if they provided disclosure. So they said this is something that's really only crystallised very recently. And again, there wasn't really any dispute that Teva and Chiesi might potentially be competitors. There was a debate about whether or not this was properly described as a recent development, development or not. But that was the second limb of the argument. And the third limb of the argument was to point out that if you look at some of the authorities in the Court of Justice about what constitutes anti-competitive information exchange, actually in some of them, relatively little has to take place in order to give rise to an infringement. And one of the authorities that both parties relied on quite heavily at the hearing was the T-Mobile case. And in the T-Mobile case, there were five Dutch mobile telephone operators and representatives of the mobile telephone operators got together and held a meeting and discussed the reduction of standard dealer remunerations for postpaid subscriptions. And this was a essentially a one-off single instance of information exchange. It wasn't a lengthy and long established practice whereby these parties exchanged information. There was really only one instance where information was exchanged and the Court of Justice indicated that that was potentially sufficient to give rise to a, an anti-competitive information exchange. And so the point was made on behalf of Teva that if really you only need one single instance of information exchange when it's conceivable that disclosure of sensitive information to your potential competitor could itself be an anti-competitive information exchange. So what did Mr Justice Burst make of this argument? If we can go on to the next slide. First of all, he agreed that Teva and Chiesi could be regarded as potential competitors, but he did say he didn't think that that was a particularly new development. And he said that the test for potential competition had been set out for some time. He then referred to the European Commission's horizontal cooperation guidelines, and he emphasised that information exchange can only be addressed under Article 101 if there's some form of collusion between undertakings. If there isn't some form of collusion, then Article 101 simply doesn't apply at all, even if there is some form of information exchange. And there are different levels of collusion the minimum level of collusion that's required in order to engage Article 101 is a concerted practice. And the Court of Justice in T-Mobile cited the uh, familiar definition of a concerted practice. It's a form of coordination between undertakings, which without it having been taken to the stage where an agreement properly so-called has been concluded, practical cooperation between them is knowingly substituted for the risks of competition. So there has to be a substitution of practical cooperation for the risks of, co of competition. That's what you're looking for in terms of showing the minimum level of collusion for Article 101 to apply. And the judge was prepared to accept that the, the provision of information between undertakings can itself amount to the requisite form of collusion. So he, he was willing to say that you don't have to have some prior or pre-existing concerted practice in order for Article 101 to apply. In the right circumstances, the mere provision of information would itself be considered to establish a concerted practice. And he also said that if the litigation had been a sham designed by the parties to facilitate some form of information exchange, then self-evidently that would give rise to the requisite level of collusion. But he emphasised that there was no su suggestion of that in the circumstances of this case. But ultimately, he was satisfied that if you have properly, what he described as properly constituted patent litigation, then the exchange of information pursuant to that litigation was not 
a concerted practice. It wasn't an instance of practical cooperation being substituted for the risks of competition. So his primary finding is there's simply no, no collusion here at all in the circumstances where a court makes an order directing disclosure. The judge also went on to look at an alternative point which had been advanced by Chiesi, which was the ancillary restraint doctrine. And the ancillary restraint doctrine is explained by the Court of Appeal in Sainsbury's. And it says that a provision of an agreement which has the effect of restricting competition will still not be an infringement of Article 101 if it's objectively necessary for the main operation of the agreement provided the main operation itself doesn't infringe Article 101. So if you have a lawful agreement and one element of that agreement is potentially restrictive of competition, if that element of the agreement is objectively necessary for re realising the main operation of the overall lawful agreement, then it won't be considered to infringe. And the position was advanced on behalf of Chiesi that even if the provision of disclosure was in some way restrictive of competition, and this was an alternative submission because the primary position was there was no restriction whatsoever. Even if it was in some way restrictive of competition, then it was necessary, it was objectively necessary for the conduct of patent litigation, and that was a pro-competitive exercise. There's plenty of European authority which says that intellectual property rights enjoy a high level of protection in the internal market, and you see that principle reiterated in the Baroxetine case. And it's also been uh, confirmed by the European courts that the possibility of generic rivals to enter the market at risk and potentially face infringement actions is actually an expression of potential competition in the pharmaceutical sector. And you see that in the Lundbeck case in the, in the general court. And in the Peroxidine case, the CAT confirmed that even if those actions actually result in the uh, originator succeeding, so the originator actually manages to uphold its patents, nevertheless that process is itself pro-competitive. So in general, patent litigation is a pro-competitive good thing. That wasn't really disputed by Tava. What Tava said was, well, you still have to satisfy the objective necessity test. You still have to show it's objectively necessary to the patent litigation for you to have this disclosure. And their point was it's not necessary for you to have this disclosure now. They said the issue of infringement can be determined after the issue of validity. And in fact, if it turns out that all your patents are invalid, disclosure doesn't need to be given at all. And so they said, actually, you can't satisfy the test of objective necessity. And ultimately, this will be considered to be a restrictive uh, exercise. Well, the judge didn't agree with that he considered that the right thing to do as a matter of case management was to resolve infringement and validity at the same time. And he was satisfied that disclosure was objectively necessary for that exercise. So in summary, he was satisfied that disclosure in patent proceedings doesn't amount to anti-competitive information exchange. Thank you very much, Sarah. I'm sure there are quite a few people who are grateful to hear that, um, <laughs> not least some of my colleagues. Um, so. Uh, that brings us, without any further ado, to Jemima Stratford QC, who has been involved in many cases, both in the competition and the public law sphere. Uh, today, she's not actually speaking about a particular case, but is going to look at the very topical question of how the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is affecting the authorization of medicines and vaccines. And she's recently written an article on this with a couple of her colleagues from Britcourt, which you can find on the website. Um, but for a tester of what that article contains, uh, Jemima, would you like to enlighten us? Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Pat. If I could, if I could have um, my first slide. So uh, as you saw, I called my section Balancing Speed and Safety, Authorising COVID-19 Vaccines and Medicines. And as Pat's mentioned, that's also the title of an article that I wrote recently with, with two colleagues, Emily McKenzie, who you're going to hear from in a moment, and Emma Mockford. Um, so that is my excuse for these pictures. Um, I'm imagining that I'm an author uh, that's been invited onto a chat show. 
uh, and I'm subtly trying to promote my writing, possibly not quite Graham Norton territory, um, but perhaps we could aspire for Andrew Marr and start the week. More seriously, what I'm going to cover um, in this slot uh, is a very brief summary, as Pat said, of what we discuss in the article, together with some updates. Um, and if anyone is interested in the detail, then you can find a link uh, to the article on, on the Brick Court website in the news section, or do, do just send an email and, and we'll get a copy to you. So if I could have the next slide, please. And starting with the basics, um, many, perhaps most of you will know much of this already, and I'll therefore take it relatively swiftly. Um, but these are the essential building blocks for understanding any medicines regulation issue, including those that are currently arising in relation to COVID-19. Fundamentally, there are two regulatory systems, a nationalised one and a centralised one. So the national first is, um, is Directive 2001-83, um, that's known as the Community Code. Um, and our national regulator is the MHRA. And there are three ways that you can uh, make a national application either a purely national application, if you only want your medicine to be on the market in one member state, only in the UK, for example, or a decentralised application, which is where you make um, a series of national applications simultaneously in a number of member states. And thirdly, mutual recognition, which is where you already have a, a marketing authorisation in one member state and you ask for that to be mutually recognized in other member states. Cent centralized applications are governed, um, at least procedurally governed by regulation 726 slash 2004. Um, the substantive rules are basically the same and they, they again come from the directive. And centralized applications are mandatory for certain types of products. Um, they're also, in fact, only available for certain types of products, but they're mandatory, for example, for biotechnological products. And for various reasons that we explain in the article, it seems very likely that a COVID-19 vaccine would be approved centrally. Um, it's important to be aware that um, when applications are approved centrally, they go through the EMA's Committee for Medicinal Products for Human Use, the CHMP, um, and then it's the Commission itself that takes a decision either to grant or not to grant uh, an authorization. Of course, you need um, to what well, you need uh, a great deal of evidence if you want to apply for and obtain a marketing authorization. So. What actually has to happen, and this is what costs so much money and usually takes so much time, um, is a series of preclinical and clinical trials um, known as phases one to five. And there are both a series of pre-application requirements, um, so things like describing the manufacturing method, um, give, providing information about the stability of the product and so on. Um, and then this series of, of preclinical and clinical tests and trials. Now, I don't know how many of you have had the surreal experience uh, that I've had over the past three years of rolling out of bed only to hear the finer points of the EU's constitution being discussed on the radio, um, points that were previously only of great interest to geeky EU lawyers like myself. Um, well, it's been a little bit like that with clinical trials over the past four months or so, because suddenly the presenters of the Today programme are well versed in the difference between phase one and phase three clinical trials. What are they? Uh, in very quick and crude terms, um, they get bigger in terms of size and variety of people participating in the trial as they go on with phase three trials usually being a large uh, blind randomized uh, controlled trial, 
um, and, and so on. Phase four trials are conducted after the marketing authorization has been granted. And it's important to keep in mind that many products do not achieve favorable results at the earlier stages, and so will never make it to phase two or beyond. To give just one example of where some COVID uh, vaccine trials have reached, the Oxford vaccine group uh, is moving on to phase two slash three trials. Um, they're being run in parallel, as I understand it, involving around 10,000 participants. And at phase three, uh, different age groups will be involved. So for example, older people and children. Um, and what they say is that if transmission remains high, we may get enough data in a couple of months to see if the vaccine works. But if transmission levels drop, this could take up to six months. And that is in turn why one's seen discussion about so-called human challenge trials. Um, that, as you may be aware, is where volunteers offer to be infected by the virus under very controlled uh, conditions. Um, and also, I noticed recently that the Oxford group are doing significant parts of their trials now in Brazil uh, for perhaps obvious reasons. So if we could have the next slide, please. And I just wanted to mention some specifics um, about COVID-19 and medicines regulation. And um, so thinking about how is a vaccine actually going to get to the population and get to, to many of us. Normally, um, a body that you probably all know about, NICE, um, has an important role in, in deciding who should have uh, access to medicines. But in this case, the Secretary of State has made directions providing that NHS England should take co-responsibility with clinical commissioning groups for commissioning treatments to address COVID-19. And that means that in practice, decisions about access and funding of such treatments will be taken centrally by NHS England rather than by NICE. Um, NICE is doing work in this area and has produced some important guidelines, but on, on the, this specific question of who can get access, um, it's going to be NHS England and the CCGs. In the case of vaccines, there is an additional body that will be involved in the process which is called the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, the JCVI for short, which isn't usually a great, talked about a great deal, but um, could be really important here. And the government said it's working on the general principle that, and I quote, people should be vaccinated as soon as a safe vaccine becomes available. It said it, that will be, quote, a major logistical undertaking and that it will seek JCVI advice on deployment. And reading all of that together with the applicable 2009 regulations, um, in practice, what it means is that if the JCVI recommends a vaccine that protects against COVID-19 as cost effective, then the Secretary of State will need to roll out a national vaccination program rapidly. Briefly, I just wanted to mention that there are questions about procurement here, which we didn't have time to address in the article, and unfortunately, I'm not really going to have time to go into now either. But I think there are going to be a host of interesting questions about how procurement will work for a vaccine, even more basically how different states, including the UK, will make sure they get access to sufficient stocks. And we've already seen the example of the US buying up the next three months worth of stock of remdesivir, which currently seems to be one of the best treatments for COVID, um, because, simply because Gilead is a US company. And at, I would suggest at the time when the WTO should potentially be coming into its own in terms of ensuring equitable trade in these essential medicines and vaccines, unfortunately, one has to doubt whether it's going to be able to fulfill that role, uh, in particular, given the lack of US support. Um, the current strained relationship between the UK and the EU in terms of Brexit um, is also not going to help matters. So you may have seen that uh, on the 17th of June, the EU unveiled its joint vaccine strategy. Um, so there's a vaccine alliance, for example, between France, Germany, Italy and the Netherlands. Um, the strategy is going to secure the production of vaccines in the EU 
um, and try to ensure sufficient supplies for member states through advanced purchase agreements. And the other main pillar of the strategy is to adapt the EU's regulatory framework to the current urgency, uh, making use of existing regulatory flexibility. But uh, in a letter, the recent letter of the 10th of July from the UK's ambassador to the EU Council, um, the UK said it's not going to join that internal EU initiative. Um, we have said we're open to various joint initiatives, including joint negotiations with vaccine manufacturers. And then I've listed on the slide um, various tools that exist already for regulatory flexibility. There's useful um, EU Q&As that you could have a look at if you're interested and also some MHRA guidance. And there are these three possibilities for speeding up regulatory assessment, accelerated assessment, temporary authorization and conditional authorization, all of which I think in the circumstances might potentially be available. Um, there is also, as I've mentioned, the EMA COVID-19 pandemic task force, um, which has various possibilities, including um, this emergency rolling review procedure. There are, just to mention, it's not all going on at the EU level. There are international initiatives as well. Um, the most relevant to mention is the International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Authorities, um, which has published various in, in useful papers you could have a look at. Finally, as ever, we can't finish without mentioning Brexit. Um, that's a real issue here, as the timing of approval of a vaccine could well coincide with the date when apparently we really are going to leave the EU um, in the sense of the so-called implementation or transition period ending. And I won't go into the detail of the various possibilities now, but if we leave without a trade deal, that makes provision for pharmaceuticals, then we could theoretically at least be left in a situation where a centralised application for a treatment or vaccine for COVID is still pending at EU level and it needs to be domesticated and taken over by the MHRA. And the way in which that would happen can only be speculation, but is likely to be dependent on the stage that the application has reached. And overall, we can be pretty sure, I hope, that whatever happens, any serious application in relation to COVID treatment or vaccine uh, will be prioritised. And somehow the regulatory authorities will show great flexibility and speed. So I'll stop there and hand over uh, now to, to Pat, back to Pat and then on to Emily. Thanks very much, Jemima. There may well be lots of questions about that and uh, you can email them in, as I said earlier. But I think given the time, we'll move on swiftly to Emily McKenzie, who, as well as finding the time to collaborate with Jemima on the COVID article, has a very busy practice on all sorts of other issues, including the particular case that she's going to speak about this afternoon, which uh, in which she represented Bayer PLC. And this is part of a, a whole array of litigation relating to a product called Avastin. Uh, and I will leave it to Emily to explain the particular uh, issues that arose very recently in this case before the Court of Appeal. Thank you, Emily. Thanks very much, Pat. Um, so the case I'm discussing uh, concerns the intricacies of medicine regulation, but at its heart, it's about the interaction of the NHS with those rules. So it's slightly different to some of the cases we've heard about already. It's about treatments for a condition called wet age-related macular degeneration or wet AMD. And that's an eye condition that can cause blindness if not properly treated. And as serious conditions go, it is relatively common, particularly amongst the elderly. The story of this case begins with the decision of various clinical commissioning groups to adopt a particular policy in relation to the treatment of this condition. So CCGs are NHS bodies that are responsible for commissioning care, and they sit above, in one sense, NHS trusts, which actually provide the care. So in mid to late 2017, there were 12 CCGs all located in the north of England who decided to adopt a joint new policy relating to wet AMD. And the policy stated that doctors within the trusts uh, under this purview of these particular CCGs should offer a drug called Avastin as the preferred treatment option for wet AMD. 
And the crucial fact that underlies the whole um, piece of litigation is that Avastin is not licensed to treat wet AMD. In fact, it's not an eye drug at all. It's a cancer drug designed and marketed to be administered via an IV and not designed to be injected into the eye. But there are two drugs that are licensed to treat wet AMD that are designed and marketed to be injected into the eye for that purpose. And these are called ILEA and Lucentis. ILEA is marketed by Bayer, um, which was my client together with um, Joanna Stratford, and Lucentis is marketed by Novartis. As well as being licensed by the regulator to treat wet AMD, ILEA and Lucentis have also been approved by NICE as being sufficiently cost effective to be prescribed on the NHS, but they are pretty expensive. Crucially, they are a lot more expensive than Avastin, the cancer drug. And the final essential background fact is that although Avastin is very different in many ways, there is a body of evidence that it can safely be used to treat wet AMD, and it has been used to do that in various settings. NICE had indeed reviewed some of this evidence and concluded that, it, that this practice is clinically effective and safe, but it didn't recommend its use. And I should say up front that the precise details of all this were and are extremely controversial. So essentially, the CCG's plan was to save money in their areas by asking trusts to prefer this cheaper cancer drug instead of the licensed eye drugs. And the cost saving was even greater than it might have been because the plan was that each vial of Avastin would be divided up into lots of small doses because Avastin comes in a vial big enough to infuse into an IV bag for the treatment of cancer, but you only need a tiny amount to inject it into the eye. And the process of dividing each vial of Avastin up into multiple doses is called compounding. And that was a really crucial feature of the case. So my client Bayer and Novartis brought a judicial review challenging this policy. And the essential basis for the challenge was that compounded Avastin can't lawfully be supplied um, under the EU medicines regime. And we said this is because there's no license, also known as a marketing authorization, permitting Avastin to be used in this way. The relevant um, legislation, the Medicines Directive, prohibits the placing on the market of a medicinal product that does not have a marketing authorization. It's possibly the most important rule of the whole regime. But the CCG said, look, all that's happening here is that a product that does have an MA, a Bastin, is being used in a way that's not anticipated by that MA. And that's generally known as off-label use, and it happens a lot. So many drugs, they're not specifically licensed to be used, for example, in children or in pregnant people, uh, but they are used that way. So anyone who's ever been prescribed aspirin, say, for high blood pressure during pregnancy, that's an off-label use of, of aspirin. But we said, well, this is different because the process of compounding of Aston, in fact, creates a new medicinal product that does need a new MA if you're placing it on the market. And there are some important points to understand here. The compounding process is a very complex one. You have to draw the Avastin up from its original glass vial in completely sterile conditions. You have to place it into multiple new containers, namely plastic syringes. Uh, you then store it. And at all stages, there are risks of introducing contamination and the shelf life of the resulting product is untested and unknown. When a drug company applies for a license for a product, it has to invest in proof of those processes and even the packaging itself is safe and there are very stringent requirements to has already mentioned for things like batch control proof of shelf life um, stability etc for context it took both Bayer and Novartis very many years indeed to gain regulatory approval to supply their products in pre-filled plastic syringes rather than glass vials but none of this would be done for the compounded avastin used to supply the policy so we said, well, there may not be a safety issue in principle with the use of Avastin, but there might be a safety issue as regards the quality of the particular Avastin that would be manufactured to fulfil the policy. In response to the claim, the CCG said, well, we don't actually have to use compounded Avastin. We could use a whole vial of Avastin, just draw up a required dose and throw away the rest. That would, of course, be wasteful, but it would still actually be quite a lot cheaper than using a whole vial of Ilea or Lucentis. And that really would be an off-label use of Avastin. So it raises slightly different considerations. But we said, well, still a policy that systemically prefers the use of either unlicensed or off-label um, products purely on grounds of cost is unlawful because it unlawfully circumvents 
the EU medicines regime and it erodes patient safety because products that are licensed or off-label haven't gone through the same um, stringent requirements and it also erodes the financial incentives for pharmaceutical companies to invest in new medicines and in new um, indications for medicines that already exist. Um, can we go to the next slide please? To cut a long story short, um, our arguments were essentially rejected both at first instance and by the Court of Appeal. I've summarised the reason brief, reasoning briefly on the slide, so I'll just go through it very quickly. The most important reason why we lost is some pretty unhelpful EU case law. And without wishing to sound partisan, the logic of these cases is extremely difficult to follow. Um, but essentially, the Court of Appeal agreed with the CCGs that this case called Apposites has created a sort of exception to the need to have a marketing authorisation for compounded Avastin, provided that two important conditions are met that I've put out on the slide. The need that has to be done pursuant to a prescription and very importantly the compounding mustn't result in any modification to avastin and now we said well this type of process whatever modification means it must encompass something that's gone through this type of process because of the risks that it introduces the oddity with the court of appeals position is that the relevant regulations now only apply if the compounding is done badly because if it's done badly and you introduce impurities for example the drug substance would have changed and it will have been modified but of course you the regulations won't have applied in advance to prevent that from happening um on to the final slide this this case is extremely complicated and i've barely done it justice and there are a myriad of other issues including some really interesting public law issues that i've not had time to cover the important takeaway i think is that the court of appeal judgment legitimates to a large extent what had long been regarded by many key players in this field including actually the department of health to be unlawful, namely the systemic preference of an unlicensed medicine over a licensed medicine purely on the grounds of cost. And on the one hand, it's of course very good for the NHS to save money where there's not a sufficient incentive for pharma companies to bring a product to market. But on the other, there are potentially real concerns about the precedent this sets in terms of protecting patient safety. This was quite an unusual case where there was a breadth of evidence about the unlicensed product. But even then, there were some real concerns, in particular, the studies NICE had looked at when it concluded that this was all safe. Um, the compounded of Aston used in those studies had been specially produced by Roche, who holds marketing authorization um, for Avastin. Whereas under the policy, of course, the compounding would, would be at large and without traceability. And the production of compounded of Aston had actually already led to the closure of the specialist compounding facility at Moorfields Eye Hospital, for example. Um, I should say, just to finish, that Bayer has applied for permission to appeal to the Supreme Court, so it's possible there may be more to say about this in the future. But at pres present, this is potentially a very broad precedent out there. It may well be that we see more regulation in this area, I think, to deal with some of the potential issues it causes. Thank you very much. Sorry for running over by a couple of minutes. Thank you very much, Emily, and I don't think at all it was your fault. Uh, we did start a couple of minutes late. Um, so I think that uh, what you did was to get through a very complicated case, as you say yourself, very quickly. So thank you very much. And uh, perhaps I could just welcome all of our other speakers back to be en banc, uh, partly to say thank you to all of you for attending. Um, I did ask for questions many times, but obviously the quality of the presentations was such that no questions were necessary. On the other hand, I can tell from what's been said that there are likely to be a number of further developments on every topic that has been discussed so far today. So I think in the interest of your time and respecting that, and also in the interest of the, the time of our panelists, if I could ask you virtually to thank the panelists for their tremendous presentations, and if I can thank you all for your attention and wish you all well, and perhaps we'll see you again for a further webinar when some of these things have been further discussed by the courts, both domestically and perhaps in Europe. So thank you very much indeed, everybody, and thank you very much, panelists.